You're watching HCAM TV. Good afternoon, Hopkinton, and welcome to August the 3rd, 2020. And you are tuned in to the Hockington Hangout Hour on HCAM TV. Thank you so much for joining us today, whether it be on our channel or on our YouTube page or on our Facebook page. We do appreciate you taking the time to spend with us. Today, we'll be bringing you an, what I feel is an important rebroadcast of a episode that we had last week where our superintendent, Dr. Carol Cavanaugh, interviewed the Board of Health Director and the head uh, nurse of the Hopkins Public School System. It was a great conversation with lots of good information about what they're thinking about and um, how they're planning for it. And speaking of that, we know that today was the day that Hopkinton is submitting its plans to the state. And just coincidentally, we have Dr. Kavanaugh scheduled to appear on the Hangout Hour for the full hour tomorrow. So please tune in live tomorrow at two, share your questions with us on YouTube, Facebook, or email, and we'll get to as many of those as we can. On Thursday, we will have uh, Sean McAuliffe, the Board of Health Director on for the full hour talking about what the town is doing, again, with the ongoing pandemic that everybody's trying to struggle through here. That'll be Thursday. On Friday, it's another one of my favorite um, segments where we are doing send in your nature photos. So if you have any pictures that you'd like to share with us, please find us on, on Facebook or just email us, studio at hcam.tv, whether it be a bird or a critter or a plant or the shot outside your back door. Um, we really love to share those with our community. And now, before we get into our segment, I'm joined by Tom, Bob, and Mike of HCAM Hall of Fame. How you doing, guys? Good, Jim. How are you? Doing all right. Hi, and Jim. and uh, you mentioned the nature photos. I believe we are giving uh, some of these away, too, if I'm correct. Oh, thank you. Well, you know what? My son is hoping that we don't promote that because he was hoping that he would get it by default. <laughs> but from what you were telling me, we already have some middle. So absolutely, please, thank you. Thank you, Tom, for remembering that. On Friday, the, um, the anchors of that segment will be selecting their favorite photos and giving away an HCAM water bottle or two. And those were nice ones. I really like those. Well, wait, you giving away the water bottles? Well, here, I'm going to send you this one here of a praying mantis in my backyard. Okay. I, I want that water bottle. Well, unfortunately, HCAM staff members can't win. Wait, you I said never nothing said about that. that. I never said that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. I, mean, I thought that was a contest. No, no, no. no. He, he said we couldn't take one out of the studio. <laughs> ah, okay. All right. So let's just be honest. Tom's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, I'd like to uh, have Bob talk a little bit about how the experience went yesterday for the first ever physically distanced high school graduation, because you were part of that team. Yes, I was, Jim, and it was a nice day for it. It turned out to have a nice breeze. There was an overcast that kept it from being too hot, and we never did get any rain, so that worked out well. But I noticed that when Evan Bishop stepped up to the podium and gave some instructions to the audience about uh, maintaining their social distance and keeping their masks on during the uh, whole procedure, even though it was a two-hour process, we started at 10 and stopped just before noon. Everybody complied. Everybody was happy to be there and glad to follow the direction so it went smooth. I've talked to several people since that uh, aired, and everybody I've talked to has said it was really nice to see the students come up. They were all impressed, obviously, with the Hopkinton High School seniors that gave their talks, gave their speeches. 
and that they really had a lot of significant information to pass on. A lot of times you wouldn't think that a senior would be that well, well spoken. Yeah. But they were. They did a great job. And I thought that uh, the uh, speakers took everybody's time into consideration. They weren't 36 pages long. Sometimes some people on HCAM can go on and on and on. But it didn't happen yesterday because it was a nice day out. So it was a good time for everybody. And it cleared out quickly. And we went on to the rest of the day it was a nice day. Which reminds me that tomorrow night, we've got the select board meeting that's coming on. I'm sure that they'll have something to say about it. And then on Thursday this week, we'll have the school committee meeting at seven o'clock at night, which by then we may have some feedback from the state on the submission that went in on Monday by the school about how they plan to reopen in the fall. Can I, can I just ask, why am I even here? You don't even need me. All we just need to do is say, here's Bob, and boom. <laughs> that was great, Bob, thank you. Oh, thank you, Jim, All I have to not do true. We All couldn't I have get to do along is play the segment. You. Yeah. you know what, I actually, uh, I was considering going to Mike for his feedback, because Mike was in the press box directing uh, of the event. But you know what, Bob did a great job. Great job encapsulating that, so thank you. Mike, what I would like you to touch upon, because I am very appreciative, why don't you mention what um, the school department has done recently con concerning connectivity, even up until Friday, in order to help us get this on the air? An amazing, amazing work by the IT department, as always. Uh, Chapin uh, and his crew, Chapin alone is just, you know, the new magician of the school. So what they were able to do is they uh, did a what they call a wireless bridge and brought internet from the middle school out to the press box. And what that allowed us to do was not only get internet, but able to plug in our equipment so we could go live on HCAM Ed. Which... Right, now that's important because there is a fiber network uh, in our town and we have different spots that we can plug in and get a video signal straight back to master control at our studio. Right. And so not only did they provide us internet, but they also provided us that special port, which allowed that fiber, Right, that fiber link was huge. Uh, which means basically we can now go anywhere. And, you know, Grant, here we are all excited that, wow, we're going to have football in the fall that we can go out live with. But then we found out, oh, my goodness, we may not have football, but now we have a graduation that we can film, which was right. amazing. So, uh, yeah, up to Friday afternoon, uh, Chapin just gave us a call saying, hey, I can see your stuff and uh, give it a little test. And... Sure enough, we're all, just before our broadcast, we were able to report that everything worked and everything did work. Everything went off. Um, and if you didn't see graduation, feel free to go to our YouTube page and take a look. It's up there now. And, uh, and uh, Evan Bishop was correct. He said it'd be about an hour, 45 minutes was what he expected. And sure enough, one hour, 48. That was great. In fact, I got an email. I, I actually was on... Uh, different location, right. um, putting out some video live on YouTube. And I got an email from a person saying, where is the graduation? I'm looking for it. And it was before I knew you were going live. So I got the, the email on my phone saying, okay, they're live with the graduation. So I emailed her back to make sure she found it. Sure. And she wrote back, these are her words exactly, not mine. And she says, yes, wonderful. Thank you, Jim. That's quite an operation Hockington has going with connecting the town to what's happening. Great job. And you know what? As we all know, we say it all the time, that is what it's all about. Well, we don't get to see it. You know, like, like we know, we don't have the Nielsen ratings where we can see who's watching. And but the only way we know is if you write us and tell us or call us and tell us. You know, it's, 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 it's nice to hear that we are because – you know, we do work so hard. And like we said in the beginning, back in 2004, we're not a real TV station, but we play one on TV. We, we do our best to be uh, the best we can for this town. Right. And, you know, you're right. We don't have the nails. And, of course, everybody asks us, does anybody ever see this? And you know what? I think the 
the largest group of our audience we can't see because if you're at home and you can watch HCAM on your YouTube channel, on your laptop, or you can be sitting on your couch with your big screen TV and watch it that way, which way are you gonna pick? And when you pick the comfy couch and watching it on TV, we can't track that. But right. we do track YouTube and Facebook. In this past week, Tom's going to give us a couple numbers in a minute. I have been very impressed at how people know us and they find us. We all know this is a very, really, really big deal that's going on with trying to open school in the fall and what's going to happen. There's a lot of concern out there um, and a lot of questions. So last Tuesday, um, Dr. Kavanaugh was here for Ask the Superintendent, and on Thursday, the school committee had a forum, and that went out live. Not only did they do a webinar on Zoom, but we got that webinar, and Bob was running it and put it on uh, HCAM. And at its peak, I'm going to steal this number, at its peak, there were 706 people watching that on HCAM, in addition to, Bob, 500 people in the webinar? Yeah, there were over 514. Uh, YouTube or Zoom has a 500 person limit, but yeah. somehow we managed to get 514 participants on that <laughs> webinar. All right, so now we're, uh, we're at 1,200 people, and there were maybe like another 100 or, or so on Facebook. So, you know, that just really shows a level of, um, of concern and interest there is in this information. So we do hope that you tune in tomorrow for Dr. Kavanaugh. But Tom, give us some, some numbers on the replays. Well, they've uh, got quite a few views. Uh, Tuesday's Hopkins and Hangout Hour, where we had an hour with Dr. Uh, Carol Kavanaugh. It had 1,100 views on YouTube and 985 additional views on Facebook. And keep, keep in mind what you just said, we know there's a lot of people watching on their big comfy couch. So, and obviously we can't track those numbers. So there was a lot of people watching on the internet and I'm sure a lot of people watching on the uh, TV channel as well. And then um, for the school committee forum, uh, this number blew me away, 3,200 views on YouTube and 773 views on Facebook. and. It's just a topic that has so much interest for obvious reasons because we're still trying to figure out are kids going to be able to go back to school safely next year. And obviously school's only about a month away. So I think everybody's very interested in this topic, which right. I can certainly see why. Well, let's right. face it, you can't get this information firsthand anywhere else. Yeah. And the opportunity, not only getting the information, but the opportunity to ask our leaders your questions right that's always valuable right and i think it's so great that uh dr kavanaugh's taking the time to come on and answer everybody's questions and i think it's uh very helpful uh for everybody in the community she's such a supporter of h camp from signing up to do the um highlights from the hill show and signing up to do her <sighs> superintendent updates that she was doing um, when, you know, the whole Budget budgeting time. problem yeah. was happening. And she was just telling me the other day uh, over email how much she, she misses doing that and how much she values us, which is just really awesome because, you know what, that's why we exist, you know, just to get people this information and connect them. So everyone out there, thank you so much for finding us and for looking to HCAM to keep you connected with what's going on. Uh, oh, and if I could just mention real quick, Thursday we'll have quick. Sean McAuliffe back on for a health update. Uh, we had 216 views of that on Facebook, uh, 81 on YouTube. So a lot of people tune in for that, but that's why I just want to get out there next Thursday. He'll be back. Thank you very much. All right. And now here comes the replay from last week. Please enjoy. And we hope to see you tomorrow. Hello, Hopkinton viewers. Um, as you know, September is just around the corner and with September comes back to school. Um, given the fact that we are starting school this year with COVID-19, uh, we are certainly receiving a whole lot of calls in the central office about students and faculty safety as we come back. 
And so I wanted to spend a little bit of time today here on HTM with two special guests. One is Sean McAuliffe, who is the Director of Public Health in Hopkinton, and Kathy Bain, who is the head nurse in the Hopkinton Public Schools, so that we could talk a little bit about some of the things that we have in place to ensure student and staff safety as we open up our buildings in the fall. So I want to preface my remarks today by saying that uh, for sure, uh, no one is ever absolutely safe and free from you know, contact with a, a COVID positive person. But we are doing all that we can in the public schools to mitigate that. And I think that that's what you know, we're here to talk about today. So I'm Superintendent Carol Cavanaugh and I welcome you to the show and I welcome my two guests. So Sean, Kathy, thank you for being here. It's a pleasure, thank you. Thank you. So I will just ask a, a few questions and then probably we'll just move to more organic dialogue. Um, but I guess, Sean, I'd like to start with you. So you have public health statistics for us and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the number of cases that you have seen among the youth in Hopkinton. And as you know, the public schools are probably most concerned with children who are in the categories of like ages three to 18. Right. So Consistent with you know national t statistics, we've had um, only one child under the age of I believe 12 that has um, come down with COVID. They had an extremely mild case. Um, I think their symptoms were limited to that of uh, like vertigo, of all things. And um, the the child you know was cleared from um, quarantine within. Um, 10 days and um, has been doing fine since. And then we've had, we had two others that contracted it um, and they, they were um, in their, I think junior, senior year. Um, and again, their cases were mild, um, somewhat flu-like and they've recovered uh, completely. Um, we've had a, a number of college kids that have uh, contracted it. Um, but again, all of our numbers are consistent with that, um, which has been seen and reported nationally. Um. Yes, I think, you know, we have put together also a reentry advisory group and both John and Kathy sit on that group. It's a 36 member team. And I think that as we have been you know, looking at reentry, we are very much heartened by the fact that I think in Hopkinton, you've had about 131 active cases only in the time of the entire pandemic. Um, so that's, that's something that is, is very heartening to us in terms of opening our schools. Uh, when you know we talk about opening the schools, we certainly always say that it won't be you know just one practice that keeps us safe. You know there has to be that sort of suite of strategies that we put into place. Everything from keeping six feet apart to wearing a mask, washing your hands, all of those kinds of things. Um, Kathy, can you talk a little bit about some of the practices that you would recommend for our students and staff while they are in schools on a regular basis? Sure. I think the number one thing is we want people to stay home, staff and the students if they're sick, um, to make sure they're washing their hands, wearing their masks if they're able to, um, looking to other options and supports for staff and students who wouldn't be able to wear any kind of facial coverage. Um, throughout the day, monitoring their symptoms as well, having specific guidelines to visit the nurse and what that will look like, because that's going to be a little bit different um, in terms of just coming to the nurse, we're going to have protocols in place so that the, someone in the building will call first to say someone's coming and the nurse can determine, is this a visit because someone got injured at recess if we're going outside or because they have some symptoms that they need to be seen in another um, location, which we're calling a medical waiting room or isolation room. So definitely the nurse piece is going to look a little different. We're excited to finish looking at protocols to put into place. Um, all the things are going to help us to be healthy throughout the day. Yes, that I'll just kind of um, piggyback a little bit on that. You know, parents have said, and, and as you know, Kathy just opened with the, if you are not feeling well, please stay home. Uh, we can't underscore that enough. So parents will will ask frequently, what are you doing about the attendance policy? And we are certainly going to excuse any COVID related um, absences this year. And the last thing we want is for people to feel like their children will be in trouble if they don't come to school. So that you know, might send them, um, what we want you to do really is to keep your child home. 
And you know, a second thing I think that is kind of important to note is that when the commissioner sent out information to families about should we be three feet apart or six feet apart, we in the Hopkinton Public Schools are committed to six feet of social distancing. And we are even thinking about in classrooms, what does that look like on top of a little bit of personal space? So my guess is that once we have all of our classrooms arranged, there would never be students who are closer than seven feet, sort of nose to nose, if that's kind of a good way to, to look at it. Um, what, would the two of you talk a little bit about how your two departments will interact in the event that you know, somebody does call down and say to you, Kathy, I think we might have a student exhibiting those symptoms, or Sean, you learn through testing that we have a, a student who has tested positive in the Hopkinton Public Schools. So I guess I've gone a long way to say that information will come from both sides. We've been working in partnership, you know, since March. So I think, you know, we, we've got a, a well-established um, dialog and set of communication in place. Um, and then we'll continue to maintain that moving forward. We worked with all of your school nurses over the summer. So everybody understands what the policies and procedures are. Um, and then we're all committed to making sure that we're providing um, as safe um, an environment as we can. Um, so, you know, if there's a case where we all, we're all familiar with the set of symptoms that we're looking at. And then, you know, one of the things that we've been discussing um, throughout the summer and as we start planning is, you know, one of the key issues is that the symptoms that we're all going to be looking for are the same symptoms that are consistent with a cold or the flu or your typical respiratory uh, symptoms. So, you know, it's, as Kathy said earlier, it's key that we keep our kids that are sick at home. And then if, if we're doing a good job at home monitoring illness um, and symptoms and and we're communicating what symptoms or seasonal allergies, et cetera, that our child might have to the school nurses, that information um, shared with the nurses and coupled with communication with the health department will help us better able to surgically assess whether or not um, a child is at risk, whether or not we have to put a cohort out, um, uh, you know, whether or not testing is required. And then we'll be working, you know, in conjunction with the parents and the school nurses um, to, again, make sure that we're identifying um, potential uh, case contacts, um, that we'll be communicating with the parents directly about the symptoms that they may need to be on the lookout for. Um, but all of this is dependent on us communicating within the school and the municipality and parents communicating with their children and really controlling that risk at home. Um, Kathy, you wanna? And I think to sort of add on that, sure. So we um, partnered with public health um, at the start of what became the pandemic in March and we've had a great relationship with both Sean and Casey on an ongoing basis. We pretty much talk almost every other day. We email frequently. There's there's definitely an ongoing communication there. As recently as this morning, I was reaching out to Casey with some questions. So that's definitely been a huge um, means of us communicating all the time. Um, I would say that in the, in the school year as it begins, a um, lot of um, guidance we'll be looking for for them as we follow all the new guidelines. Um, students that we're seeing and sort of feeling out, you know, this student is asymptomatic, but has this, this uh, staff member is symptomatic. I think there's going to be a lot of times we're going to be working together to kind of filter out those pieces. I'm also frequently in contact with Stephanie Boder, who's our school physician, to kind of look over protocols we're developing. And she's been a great resource for us. And I know Sean knows her, as, um, spends time with her as well. So I think all of those things are going to help to allow us to free flow our communication throughout the day with staff, students, parents, the community. And I would add that, you know, we, we have programs in place right now that we are looking at and monitoring um, and evaluating um, as 
you know, how we can model and how we can, I mean, these, these programs are implementing um, protocols that are intended to be rolled out at the start of the school year. And we're, we're looking at these and figuring out, you know, how we can better maybe hone a practice or what communication needs to go out to either the parents, the teachers, um, or the staff. Um, and, and if we're monitoring these, and again, modeling the behavior that we expect. Um, and then if everybody is diligent at monitoring uh, for symptoms, um, I, you know, I am confident that we can provide a safe school environment. We've seen programs like the Y, we've seen programs, you know, within the school and other programs um, in our own parts and rec department where we've implemented these same policies that will be deployed um, and those have caught, um, caught, you know, either cases or possible cases before they've got into the program and we've been able to run, um, run our summer programming really without disruption. Um, and, um, and I believe we, all of these programs have run safely and, you know, knock on wood, I'm knocking on wood a lot. We haven't had any instances of illness in a program that is implement that it has implemented the programs that the school department will be rolling out. So and I think in addition to that, you know, we looked at training prior to the start of our program, the extended school year program, and looking to building on that as we enter into re-entry for the school year and what our trainings will look like for the staff and the families and resources. And I think we're just building on what we've found to be successful so far and adding recent guidelines. Right. And and these programs and procedures are consistent with everything that we've been running with our public safety departments, our DPW, with the health department itself. And again, you know, we have right now um, the lowest rate of absenteeism in these programs or in these departments. We haven't, knock on wood, had any um, illness within or, you know, COVID issues since we've um, rolled out these programs, gone through the education, the training, um, and we are, we are utilizing, you know, uh, the same types of PPE protocols. We're using the same systems for monitoring that will be deployed at the school. And again, it, it's been successful on the municipal side. Um, you know, I work at the fire department and um, we, we, we review, we rehearse, um, we, uh, we review our policies at the hospitals. All of this stuff is gonna be what we roll out in the school system. And again, we've demonstrated that it works. So I, I think that we can, you know, I, I believe that going into the school year, um, we're, we're going in with some good plans, protocols and procedures. Yeah, I love what you're saying about we've demonstrated that it works. I think it's so important for families to hear that, you know, not only are the adults in town coming to work every day and making very good choices about, you know, PPE and adhering to wearing their masks and following all the protocols, but we additionally have, you're right, summer camps, park and rec, um, the Y, ESY, all of those programs are open where children and adults are interacting and they are doing so, you know, sort of safely. And again, I will say knock on wood, but successfully. So that's nice for us to hear. Um, I will share just briefly an anecdote that I, I share sort of wherever I go, but in the reentry advisory committee, we have a hospital CEO who has shared that she has 3,500 physicians in her, in her hospital and 72 of those people have tested positive through the COVID pandemic. And for the most part, those are folks who are, you know, getting the virus outside of the hospital and bringing it in as opposed to getting it inside of the hospital from a patient, which again, sort of lets us know that, you know, with the right PPE, you know, you can be pretty safe. Um, I think parents may have concerns and teachers may have concerns about the virus living on surfaces. So if I'm a teacher, say for example, that uses a desk that another teacher has used, 
or you know, a child comes into a classroom. And just to be clear, we are planning to disinfect our um, every classroom in every building every night. We, we have the, the capability to do that. But can you talk a little bit about how the virus lives on surfaces or doesn't live on surfaces? What are we learning about that? One of the, I mean, one of the, if there's anything positive to come out of the, the cruise ship studies, the, uh, the naval ship, uh, the, naval, the illness on naval ships, that gave us um, these, these active work areas to, for researchers to go in and study. So we've seen studies coming out of the um, National Institutes of Health, the CDC, uh, I think FDA, um, and mul multiple research labs have gone in. And what we're seeing is that the COVID, the COVID virus tends to last longest on hard, non-absorbent surfaces. Um, so if we are cleaning those hard, non-absorbent surfaces, such as tabletops, uh, push bars, door handles, um, kind of the, your typical child's uh, seat back, stuff like that. Um, it, like even the CDC is recommending that a lot of these surfaces are either used after uh, they're clean, if they're cleaned after heavy use or cleaned at least on a daily basis, the risk of transmission from those surfaces is low. Mm -hmm. uh, then coupled with, you know, I would argue that, you know, most say middle school age kids and older teachers, staff members don't exhibit what's called a lot of pica behavior, you know, hand to mouth behavior. So if you're washing your hands throughout the day before, especially before you eat, there should be a low risk of transmission because you're not introducing, you know, like as long as you're keeping your hands out of your eyes, your nose and your mouth, there should be a very low rate of transmission when you start looking at younger children, they're, they're, they're not as susceptible. Um, I, my understanding is that the rate of transmission by introducing the virus into your gut as opposed to your lungs is really low. Um, <clears throat> so again, if we're, if we're modeling the good behavior in the elementary school aged um, environments, um, and we're, you know, we're having our children wash their hands uh, frequently if they're using hand sanitizer. Um, if we're picking up on instances where someone may have sneezed and the child might be going after a, an item, if we're taking that item um, out of circulation and putting it into a sanitizer or sanitizing solution, we, we can control those exposures and, and um, so at the end of the day, they're really showing that there isn't a lot of uh, transmission through contact with contaminated surfaces. And for things like carpets, paper, um, those surfaces um, tend to uh, attract the oily covering on this virus. And um, so they promote the breakdown of the virus. So again, it, again, as long as we're following the cleaning protocols that we have set up. We're utilizing the EPA approved um, cleaners with proper frequency, and we're really focused on hand hygiene. That shouldn't be an issue in, in our schools. I'll just chime in and say a little bit about hand hygiene. Um, and I, I'm not gonna steal your thunder, Nurse Bain. I'm gonna let you say your signature line. <laughs> Um, but one of the things that uh, we we do have in the way of protocols is, you know, we've talked to the commissioner about reducing the number of minutes that in and hours the kids need to have this year for time on learning, so that we can build in time for our kids to wash their hands or use hand sanitizer when they arrive. You know, obviously after they use the bathroom, before they eat lunch, after they eat lunch, when they move from one physical area to another, and even before dismissal. So they, kids will be washing their hands and using hand sanitizer all day long in the 
Hopkins Middle School and High School where there are not sinks and soap in classrooms, we have actually installed hand sanitizer dispensers in every one of those classrooms. So I do like what you're saying about you know making sure that your hands are clean and they are away from your face. Uh, the other thing that I will say about uh, faces is that we are going to be a full on mask district from K to 12. So even if you are the kind of person who has a tendency to put your hands to your mouth, they, your mouth will be covered uh, all day with a, a mask. Yes, we're having mask breaks and yes, we will do uh, education around how to put that mask on properly and how to take that mask off properly. And Kathy, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about those kinds of things. Well, I am a person who has a shirt that says, how about you wash your hands? So like I'm faithful to hand washing and you know, it's something we're going to do in an age appropriate kind of way. Some social stories, video, there, there we're definitely going to be out there and kind of meeting everybody where they are, you know, washing your hands or sanitizing before you take off your mask, your mask break. And then before you put it back on, we know that there are going to be some friends who when you talk about sneezing are going to need to have their mask replaced. So we're definitely going to have a backup supply. Um, the nurses, um, have an abundance of supply for themselves as well. And uh, we are taking part in um, training. It's called fit testing with Casey, um, the public health nurse to be able to wear an N95 should that need you know, arise. Um, so we're definitely prepared for the staff, the students, visitors, and, and all of the nurses as well in terms of the PPE piece. And, and Casey and I are going to run some programs um, over the month of August in preparation for the school year, just to get kids familiar with masks where we might have a, a mask decoration day where Casey and I will teach kids um, over the month of August how to put them on. We'll have them decorate the masks. Um, we're, um, my, the last project that my intern participates in will likely be uh, uh, a mask promotion campaign where um, we're going to probably print out shirts and then encourage other children in uh, town to come out with um, uh, creative mass slogans and designs, and then we'll put those on t-shirts that we'll distribute. But um, one of my friends in town has come up with a, we put the MA in masks. Um, so we're thinking about having some t-shirts and masks uh, kind of with those logos. Again, and it's all to get kids comfortable with using the masks. And, um, and then we'll also be, um, this just came out, today it's at it's not technically public right now but um the governor's mask order has now been put into uh, mass general law so um, that actually allows the health department to have a little more control over masks um, and mask education so um again the, a lot of this is, as, as we've discussed, it's all about education and acclimation. So it's like we're committed to getting um, the, the residents and the students there um, by September, and then you'll have a better baseline to work from as uh, we start the reentry. Yeah, I like what you're saying about families getting their children sort of accustomed to wearing their masks, you know, one that feels comfortable on the student's face, one that kind of fits the student's face. All of those pieces are going to be very important to kind of practice at home before September. Uh, but let's imagine for a moment that um, in one of our classrooms across the district, we do have a student who tests positive for COVID-19. Um, how is it that other families or teachers are made aware of whatever risk level they may have encountered in that situation? Well, I mean, that that's, you know, Casey and our job will be to first sit down, identify the students that are in the class, identify what the seating arrangement is, and then we will sit down with either ourselves and or with the assistance of case trackers, and we'll have personal conversations with the parents, the students, um, to identify um, who's at risk, and then with the school using this, uh, with the six foot seating arrangement, you know, our, our hope and intent is that we should be able to, you know, have these quick discussions so that we can identify just the, the immediate case contacts so that we can 
limit the disruption within the classroom, but also, you know, our, jo our job is to identify, to reduce the risk, um, and then we'll manage those, um, those contacts, um, you know, through the health department. And then again, we'll be working with the, uh, the public health nurses, um, to make sure that we're communicating, you know, you know, how long the kids will be out, whether or not we need, um, any other, you know, teachers or students to be, um, monitoring for symptoms, what those symptoms should be. Um, but, you know, we, we will be following the state and CDC protocols on case tracking, um, case management, but, um, we, we, you know, we do this and definitely in Hopkinton, um, a lot more personal, we, we, you know, we, we provide a lot more personal attention to this than you might get um, outside of Hopkinton. And, um, and our job is to educate everybody so that they know um, where they stand when they're going to be released from quarantine if necessary. And then we will provide any assistance with um, identifying um, testing facilities. We, we, in addition to keeping a list of testing facilities, we maintain a list of those that have a faster turnaround um, or other options so that we can um, provide additional answers or clarity about um, their, their, their status. And um, again, we try to provide them um, as quick uh, uh, a turnaround as we can um, so that again, we can maintain some continuity and minimize the disruption in, um, in a family's uh, life. And just to add to that, I think part of your question, Carol, is about notification. So in terms of a staff member or something, knowing that would also, that would be guided by Sean and his department as well in terms of the notification piece. Right. But again, it's all about communicating. Um, and so there'll be the personalized communications between the, the cases, the case, uh, contacts in the department and then the families um, in those affected um, classrooms because at the end of the day um, we want to make sure that we're a lot uh, just reducing any fear concern um, and, and then if we have an educated um, population um, I, I think we can bring a lot more ease um, to um, these kind of unsettling times. Yes, and I think, you know, some of what you're talking about there is of great concern, not only to families, but also to our faculty. You know, how will they know if there's a student in their class, for example, that has tested positive? And while I have said this many, many times, I will repeat it that, you know, what, what we are seeing as a general um, condition is that if you are a student under 18, your symptoms are far less than if you are, you know, kind of an older adult. Um, and we do have some of our faculty who are, you know, uh, older than 40, older than 50, older than 60. And, you know, each time you advance a decade or you may have some kind of underlying health condition, you know, things are different, I think, than if you're a 10 year old sitting in our, our classrooms. But one of the things that we're sort of lucky about, I guess, K to five is that in terms of contact um, tracking and notification, our kids are going to sort of be in a very small world, you know, right. so they'll be in a classroom, they'll sit at the same desk, they'll sit at the same place to eat lunch, they'll travel with the same cohort of children, they'll come in the same door every day. So they'll ride the same bus, they'll sit in the same seat on the same bus. So it's really sort of easy to know where they've been and, you know, with whom they've been. Uh, it gets a little bit trickier, I think, at, at the high school level. Um, but certainly, you know, it would be our immediate response to alert anyone about uh, contact with somebody who is COVID-19 positive because, you know, our first and foremost goal is obviously to mitigate um, and stop the transmission of the virus, right? And, and research is showing that, you know, ch children under the age of 12 have uh, very few receptors that are, th so the, the receptors that COVID utilized to get into the cells they um they just have a lot fewer of those 
receptors available. And that's why we're not seeing um, an, an, a higher level of um, infectivity or whatever in the youth population. And those, you know, so when you go from age, I think 12 to um, 18, there's, there's a slight increase, but it's really not until you get um, well, you know, 20 and older that the uh, cells are present at a high enough concentration where it becomes, um, uh, you know, a greater risk. And then, and then in that population, um, you know, you know, people may have experimented with smoking or have had other illnesses or injuries that cause um, these receptors to be more, uh, I guess, present more in um, your body. And uh, so, you know, if, 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 if in general, if your child is healthy and um, th there really should be a low amount of risk um, as from, uh, there should be a lower amount of risk in the classroom in general. Um, and, uh, and I believe that, again, our children should be uh, in good hands if we're all following uh, the proper protocols. So Kathy, I'm going to ask you a question about ESY. So ESY is a summer program that takes place in our schools. And I know Kathy, you were the school nurse who worked at ESY for a great number of years. And you know, I can tell by your surroundings that you are at the Elmwood School right now. Hey. Uh, so my question is, how has ESY changed because of the presence of COVID? Sure. I think a couple of the bigger changes were we just we right away identified that having ESY in two separate buildings um, sort of brought the need to having a nurse in each building because you want to have that nurse professional person that's there to be um, available to students, staff, and families for any kind of discussion, assessment, you know, follow up, as well as communicating with Sean and Casey. Um, I think the look to it's a little bit different in that we wanted to make sure that the that the families um, had training before. We taught, we met with them on Zoom at night. I was part of that as well. And we did training with them. Um, Dr. Zaleski talked to them about the program. We talked about all these safety measures we had in place in terms of hand hygiene, mask wearing, um, PPE. Um, we also spent on the additional time um, with the staff doing training. You know, how do you don a gown if you need to? How do you take it off? You know, you think that that's simple, but there is a sort of a routine to that. Um, Sarah and I, the ESY lead nurse, um, spent some time developing protocols before, talking about what it would look like if she needed to see a student who perhaps had, or a staff member who perhaps had um, COVID-like symptoms or COVID symptoms, you know, what an assessment would look like, where that would happen. And so there were additional steps focused on the safety of a summer program that looks different from when I was the ESY nurse and there wasn't a pandemic. Um, you know, hand hygiene was always something that we did, but it's all of these additional steps that are helping to make the program successful and for the kids to feel safe and parents to feel secure with that. So I guess I'm wondering before we kind of wrap things up, um, you know, my advice to, to parents would be to just follow all that entire set of strategies that we have, everything from wearing that mask to, and I should point out now that we have bought a plexiglass face shield for every student in the Hopkinton Public Schools, and those are absolutely available to parents. We are thinking about making them a requirement for riding the bus. Um, but beyond, you know, the masks and the hand washing, staying home when you're sick, you know, covering your coughs and sneezes, you know, all of those things that we are asking people to do on, on a daily basis. Do you have any sort of advice or some comment that you would like to make that you feel like it's one of those things that every parent should know about sending their child to school or every teacher should know about coming back safely or as safely as possible into our buildings? So for me as a school nurse, I'm always thinking about the social emotional piece as well. So I think that parents are going to be anxious and we want them to be able to verbalize that and share those concerns. But I also think have thoughtful discussions with their children about, you know, sort of talking about all the things that we're doing and helping their kids to feel comfortable coming and whether that's practicing with a mask or washing their hands or, um, allowing their children to ask those questions about what's that going to look like? What, what, what do you mean all my friends are going to be on the bus? To have some 
family kind of time to talk about fears and expectations and that everybody's going to be happy to see their friends and good things are going to happen and you're going to have a classroom experience, but it will be a little different so that there's that comfort level and that balance. Um, because we all haven't been together, you know, since March. And I think, you know, you want to be able to have those converse, uh, open conversations. Yes. And you raise a great point there because I think, you know, that looks different at every level. You know, for our younger children, they are going to feel a little bit sad that even though they're with their friends, they're not with their friends. Um, and I think when that translates to, you know, more of our adolescent aged kids in the middle school and high school, you know, we're really going to need for those students to recognize that even though they're with their friends, they're not physically close to their friends in terms of proximity. It's really important. So thank you. Well, and, and Casey and I, you know, we both have young children. And so, you know, my, my five and nine year old, we sit down and we've discussed how, um, you know, we've discussed how it's going to look um, when they go back. They're, they're excited to see their friends, but they also, you know, even my five-year-old understands that things are different because of COVID. Um, there, we've had these de discussions and she, I, I, I think she really understands a lot more maybe than we give her credit for. And she knows that, that my job is to help ensure that she has a safer uh, school experience. And, and what I would say is that we're doing everything we can on our end to ensure that, um, you know, the children in Hopkinton and the parents in Hopkinton can send their schools or they can go to school with ease. And that um, we are going to continue to review our practices and tweak our practices to make sure that we're providing um, a safe, an experience as we can. And, um, and because it's not just that we're going through the motions, it's because we have a vested interest in making sure that these school environments are safe because our children are, you know, participating in the programs, um, Absolutely. You know, in school and, and same to be said for the teachers and that, you know, staff and administration, um, you know, we're, we're all in this together. And that's at the end of the day, if, if we follow this community model where if we're all committed to um, doing our part, um, again, I'm confident that we can have a positive um, fall school experience. And I appreciate that very much. I think, you know, listening to the two of you and doing some significant reading, you know, that also instills confidence for me that we can open our doors if we do have that community participation in making good choices. Um, as a school district, I think we get to the place where we do, in fact, have to weigh you know, what, what are the needs of our kids and, you know, beyond just the, that sort of school achievement and the academic growth that, that I think we need, there is a, a lovely social, emotional, behavioral, nutritional, all of those other components come to be in our public schools and our kids need that too. So as we're weighing the kind of pros and cons and, you know, the very carefully calculated risk levels, I think it, it makes great sense to bring our kids back into schools and to do that in ways that are, you know, mitigating risk and, and practicing all, all the safety measures. Uh, we do have, you know, behavioral expectations for our kids. We have physical plant preparedness, um, alliances with, you know, town organizations such as the, the DPH. We have protocols around lunch and transportation and all of those things. So I'm, I'm very excited for the start of school, but I'm also very cautious. And I want people to know that we are taking every care to make sure that children and staff are safe. And in the event that, you know, there is a spike in the virus, we are prepared to return to remote instruction. Just prior to this, I had a, um, I was on a chain call with all of the um, local health directors, just um, trying to assess um, what policies and procedures that we have or that are common um, within our districts um, and what, uh, what differences um, 
we should be, or what areas for improvement uh, we might recommend. So this is a this is something that we're working on, you know, every minute of every day. And then we have, we're in contact. I have two calls, three calls a week, with the DPH, the Department of Labor, um, the and multiple other state agencies, so that we are sharing all of these best practices, and then we can bring those best practices to bear, um, you know, in Hopkinton. And it's, you know, it's, 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 it's a lot of commitment, but um, again, you know, we believe that uh, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be considering opening the schools if we didn't think we could do it um, safely. So. And similarly, after this, I'll be joining my um, regional nurse leader working summer group where the nurses, fr nurse leaders from mostly around here, um, but out as far as um, what DPH considers Metro West way out there, um, talking about protocols and having a like templates. And so we're communicating the same things to pediatricians and providers. And um, so I think that professional piece of it is important as well. And being in contact with the DPH school health unit in terms of what comes from DPH comes through them out to us and um, just maintaining that connection as well, I think has been important. Well, I wanna thank you both for being here today. I think you know the information that you are able to share with me, I mean, obviously I'm not a medical professional. <laughs> I come from an academic educational background. So I really do need you know the two of you and Casey and all of the other school nurses as part of this team to make sure that we're making good decisions about reopening our schools. Um, if there are parents or faculty or students who have additional questions, you can always reach out to me in the superintendent's office. And thank you both again for being here. And thank you to HCAM for uh, being able to film this and uh, help us out with some educational TV. Okay, and we're back. Just a couple minutes left. I want to extend, oops, sorry, there we go, here I am. Wanted to extend my thanks to um, to those professionals for sharing their time with us and also if you're interested in more tomorrow on the hangout hour will be our superintendent dr carol cavanaugh who will be discussing personal protective equipment and cleaning uh, and issues such as that and she'll be live from two to three so please feel free to send us your comments and your questions there's all kind of ways that you can get in touch with us either through the um, Facebook comments or through YouTube chat, or you could send us an email uh, to studio at hcam.tv, or you could go on our website and visit the contact us form and send in your question that way. On our first program, we had all four methodologies used for people to contact us, which is really awesome for me. I'm really happy to see that people are connecting with us and we know this is a critical, huge, important that touches upon everyone in our community. And our goal is to share as much information as we can and to keep you informed and connected during these difficult times. So that is going to wrap up for this show and I hope that we will see you again tomorrow at two o'clock, same bat time, same bat channel, and uh, bring your questions for the school system. All right, thank you very much for watching the Hockton Hangout Hour. On behalf of Bob and Matt, who were my team today working on the show, we thank you for your time, and we'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.